Hey, welcome back, everybody. Ray Lucia Jr. And this is Joe Lucia. And this is Managing Your Financial Future podcast with Lucia Capital Group. Today, we're going to talk about Joe asset location, not to be confused with asset allocation. Yeah, everybody's out there pitching asset allocation, draw you a pretty pie chart, tell you where you should put your funds, how you should allocate your investments. But asset location is just important. Well, I kind of geek out on this stuff, you know, because really asset location, it's a lot about, you know, managing your taxes at the end of the day. And with my CPA kind of nerdy background, I'm, I'm happy to talk about such what may be a boring topic, asset location today. Actually, we bring this up, and maybe the guys are going to talk about it after we hand it over to them. But I put them to the task, this was a little bit ago, to see how much income that someone could generate, taxable income, and potentially pay virtually no federal income taxes. And they're able to do it. Now, I don't want to set the expectation that everybody could do it in a certain situation, certain type of uh, uh, categorization of, of, of income. But the point is, is with proper planning, Joe, you can reduce, potentially reduce your taxable income and then therefore pay less taxes over time. And we all know there's only a couple things in financial planning that you really can't control. It's how much risk you're willing to take and potentially how much in taxes you'll pay. Today, we're going to talk about the tax part of it, which is how do you locate the right types of investments in the right types of accounts? Broad brush, generally speaking, you've got ordinary income producing assets and capital gain producing assets. And what happens is most people spend most of their life saving into qualified accounts, 401ks, and they build up huge qualified accounts. And when it's time to retire, that's the only money they have. Yeah, and, and it comes and out, right? It comes out at ordinary income tax rates. All taxable is ordinary income. And ordinary income for those novices out there in all tax brackets is a higher tax rate than your capital gains tax rate. So think about it this way. Capital gains tax rate, good. <laughs> ordinary income tax rate, not so good. The guys today are going to help us at least determine if you have the ability to move certain investments into certain asset locations that are more tax beneficial. And to avoid, most importantly, investing, if you can, capital gains producing assets in an account that converts it to ordinary income. And the fact of the matter is, and, it's, and the guys are going to get into it, you really should be thinking about you know, how much you have across kind of three broad categories, your taxable accounts, your tax deferred accounts, and your tax free accounts. And ultimately, someday down the road, when you have a retirement distribution strategy, along with your asset location strategy, which accounts and how much of each account type are you going to draw income for retirement. So with that, let's send it over to the boys, Johnny Dean and Rick, the Professor Plum. It's been almost two decades we've been on this journey to educate, liberate, and help you take action so you may better manage your financial future, achieve peace of mind, and accomplish your life's purpose. This podcast reveals financial tips, strategies, and insights that will help you set your goals and guide you along the way to help you achieve them. This is Managing Your Financial Future, brought to you by the advisors at Lucia Capital Group. I'm your host, Johnny Dean, with our own Rick the Professor Plum, Chief Financial Planning Officer. Now, welcome you back to the podcast. Thanks so much, Johnny Dean and uh, Professor Rick Plum. The whole gang's here. Uh, we do talk about managing your financial future, not just f uh, your future, but your, your your present as well. And a lot of that has to do with what we're going to talk about here today. I'm here with Professor Rick Plum, certified financial planner and uh, all around fun guy to hang around with. Someday we're just going to have to talk about old movie lines and quotes from the TV show MASH. Does that work for you? Yeah, that'll work fine with me. You're a happy guy. Well, you know... W I don't know if anybody else will get it. I don't know if anybody else will appreciate it, but we will. I, I know I would, yes. And I think that's all that matters. Uh, you know, we talk about managing your financial future. Professor, sometimes it's about managing the present so that the future can help manage itself, so well, to speak. When you're making decisions about the future, you have to know whether that's a good decision or not based on where you are today. Exactly. So you have to know where you are today so that you can see what impact mm -hmm. are you going to be putting yourself in a better position 
or a less than desirable position from where you are today. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Now, now Ray Jr. brought up a, an example here, and I, I'm going to talk about this because it has to do with what we called asset location. That was the point. <laughs> now, people have heard of asset allocation. Should you have small cap, mid cap, international? Stocks, stocks bonds, bonds, cash. Bonds, I mean, what, Whatever it is, and allocate a certain amount of money to those. But asset location is very rarely talked about, but it's one of the keys to financial planning. And unfortunately, when it is talked about, I think they talk about it incorrectly. And it has to do with taking money out of an IRA, but never taking it out until the required minimum distributions happen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we've seen that. And it doesn't mean to say that you should never do this or always do that, but you should consider strategies that are appropriate to your situation. So let's let's take this example. Ray, Ray brought this up quickly, and, and I'm going to dissect this with you here uh, for just a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, somebody who, in, in this example, paid $10,000 for a stock. All right? Years ago, it's at least a year. We'll say it's many years ago. And it's now worth fifty grand. Not a bad investment. No, it's gone up by five times. Yeah. I think you've, you've, you could call yourself lucky in that well, sense. Most people would say, I did that on skill. There was well, no luck involved there. However you look at it, <laughs> yeah, IRS right. doesn't care if it's luck or skill. They're going to say, we want our money. Uh, in some instances. So here's the deal. Uh, we could put that in a number of different places. Well, going back to it's now we're going back in time. We have that $10,000 in our hot little hands. Should we be buying that stock in our IRA? Should we be buying it in our personal account? Mm -hmm. Because we could, assuming we have 10000 in our IRA or 10000 in our brokerage account, we could be buying that stock in either situ in either place. Where should we be buying it? Yeah, let's uh, and let's change it to to tradition from traditional IRA. Let's say four hundred one k because we're going to put uh, we're going to give you three options: your four hundred one k, your personal account, or your Roth. And the Roth will be the IRA will, will represent the IRA in this case, just to avoid confusion. How's that? Okay, well, uh, okay, I, I've, I've got a clear cut answer on that one, but okay. Well, you can give it if you want. Well, if I'm buying this stock, like we were talking about, that I truly expect to just go through the moon, just you know, all the way. This, this is going to make it, man. This is a big one. I want that in my Roth. You want that in your Roth? There's absolutely. no question. But, but, but first of all, I have to have a Roth. First, get, get a Roth. Roth. <laughs> well, and then second, become prescient enough to know that it's going to go through the roof. Well, it, I mean, when you you're buying an individual stock, most of the time when people are buying individual stocks, they believe that it's going to do well. Yeah, but this could also be a fund. It could be anything. I okay. mean, any equity type position. I well, could have changed it to fund. I'll tell you that this is where the problem comes in, because a fund is different than buying a stock. It is. And because you don't expect a fund to do, you know, in, like in your example, go from ten to 50000 in a couple five it's, years it's probably not going to do that but a stock a flyer you know maybe could it could but let's it could just, go to zero too <laughs> for the sake of argument we'll pretend it's a stock and we pretend that we just bought it because we like the name and i don't know it doesn't matter why but but it is uh, so so the question is do we buy it in our 401k because it's let's just say it's available in our 401k is it Rarely, but we'll, no. we'll go with your premise and you know, right. using that tax-deferred account as the 401k. <laughs> That's true. I just had that thought. Our, uh, I thought our, of it earlier, but I wasn't going to try to correct you. <laughs> our Roth IRA, that's why it's more likely to be a fund, but anyway, uh, our Roth or our uh, personal account. Okay, so I got this $10,000, and I don't know which way the stock's going to go, but I have this choice. Now, how do I make that choice initially, Professor Plum? Well, most of the time people make the choice by where the cash is. <laughs> I yeah. don't have cash in, in all of these accounts, so I'll buy it where the cash is. But if I had that option, now it's a question of which advantage am I looking to take advantage of? I mean, am I looking to take advantage of the capital gain rate that the mm -hmm. personal portfolio could provide me? Am I looking to take advantage of the tax deferral that the 401k or Roth IRA could... Let, let's leave the Roth out of this because in any case, I want it in the Roth if I think there's going to be good growth. Yeah, of okay. course. So we'll just go with the tax deferred or personal account. And so with the personal account, I could potentially get long-term capital gain rates held for more than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I could get a step up in basis if either myself or my spouse passed away. So I wouldn't have to pay any taxes on the growth that happened before I died. Those are good things. Now, the other side of it, the IRA, I can let it go and... I know when it's going to hit the top, it hits the top, and I know when to sell it, and I sell it, and I pocket all that gain, and I, with the IRA, I don't have to pay any tax on it right away. The disadvantage of doing it in my personal account, 
I told you the advantages, the capital gain rates mm-hmm. and the step up in basis potentially. The disadvantage is when it's run its course and I want out, assuming I got a gain, I got to pay the tax at that point. And I don't have the option of deferring that tax unless I stay in that stock which may be more risk than I'm willing to accept. Well, and that's that's the decision that you have to make. When you sell anything, I don't care if I have a million percent gain, if it's in my IRA and I make a sale, my traditional, my, my pre-tax money, there's no tax to be paid until that money comes out of the IRA. Now, But when it comes out of the IRA, it'll be at ordinary income rates rather than capital, capital gains, gains rates. Which is what makes this this whole asset location thing interesting. Now, it, And one other thing, with that money is in my IRA, when I am 70 and a half and older, I have to deal with required minimum distributions. And so the larger the growth is in my IRA, the larger my required minimum distribution going forward, which may mess up everything in my retirement planning with my taxability and my Social Security. Maybe it puts yep. me over the uh, income-related monthly uh, adjustment amount for Medicare. Irma. Irma. So th- there's a lot of thought process that goes into location. Well, there is when you're trying to decide where to buy something. And, and you know what? It, it can just be a guessing game. You honestly don't know which way this is going to go. But let's talk uh, about the importance of asset location, just as uh, as we use this example. I, I paid 10000 for a stock many years ago. It's now worth $50,000. I come to you and I say, well, how much am I going to pay in tax if I have to sell it? There is no one right answer because it's going to depend on where that asset is located. Which account do you have that asset in? All right. So I paid 10000 years ago. Uh, it's in my, well, let's just say, it's in my traditional IRA. Right. All when right. I, when I sell that stock, I don't pay any taxes on it if it's in my IRA. I will ultimately have to take the money out of the IRA at some point, and I will pay ordinary income taxes on it at that point. Mm -hmm. But for right now, I don't have to pay any taxes. So whatever my tax bracket is, once it comes out of the IRA, that's the rate that I'm going to pay. And And so if I'm in the 22% bracket, I'll pay 22%. If I'm in the 12%, I'll pay 12%. Now, the difference is if I had had that money in my brokerage, personal brokerage account, and I sold it, that gain if I basically, if I'm in the 12% ordinary income tax bracket mm-hmm. and all that gain fit in the 12% income bra- tax bracket, then it's a zero capital gain bracket. And if I'm in the 22% or higher you know, ordinary income bracket, the gain would be either 15, maybe 20 if you're really lucky, um, but mostly 15% instead of 22 or higher. Right. So it's going to depend on where you happen to to uh, to own that. Right. Now, on the other hand, if I had bought it in my Roth, on your third hand, yeah. if I had bought it in my Roth, in most cases, there's a very good likelihood that if I followed all the rules and I'm over 59 and a half, et cetera, et cetera, that there's going to be no tax to be right. paid. And that's why I wanted to leave the Roth out of it, because I think growth is better in the Roth. <laughs> You're right. Uh, it, if I'm selling it, it's an IRA. I don't pay any tax because it's tax deferred. The Roth IRA is tax deferred until I get out to having a Roth IRA for at least five years and I'm 59 and a half. Both those things are met. Now the money coming out, regardless of where the money's coming from, interest, dividends, capital gain, my original principal, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's all tax free. All tax free. Now now this would, would bring up the question, then why not take any asset, capital type asset that you own, if you're gonna own it for any length of time at all, why not just dump it all into the Roth. Well, Why even pe- bother with you know traditional IRA? Because some people don't have the ability to contribute directly to a Roth. Some people don't have the ability to even do a backdoor or a Roth two-step. So they don't have the Roth option to start with. Also, maybe it's you know you wanted to put fifty thousand into it, and you can only put what six thousand, seven thousand a year into your Roth right now. Mm-hmm. So you have the capability, but you don't have the. You've got fifty thousand in your bank account that you want to buy the stock with, but you can't do it in the Roth because the money's not in the Roth yet. There is a limit to how much you can put inside of it. Well, it's Roth or traditional; they're both IRAs. Uh, it, but we it, seem much to have bigger contribute. traditional IRA balances than Roth IRA balances uh, uh, because we can do rollovers from our four hundred one ks where people do the majority of their saving anyway. Yeah. And, and and the 401k, of course, oftentimes that's, in, in many cases, I think that's the only investment that people have. Uh, any for long term, yeah. But I mean, all of these come into play, but asset allocation has a lot, uh, location, excuse location. me, has a lot to do with not just the tax consequence, but the strategic planning aspect of looking at the required minimum distributions. And while we've talked about, you know, there's some advantages of that tax deferral, if we're getting to the age of 70 and a half and above, and we have to start pulling money out of it, we have to look at where does our asset 
allocation call for monies to be invested in the first place, then fit that allocation into the appropriate locations so that we are planning for required minimum distributions. The income assets can be satisfying the RMD rather than creating income assets personally and then applying more you know, taxation from an RMD on top of those. And somebody's saying, what, did, what the heck did he just say? I mean, It's called planning, and it's necessary, and well, it's fun. It's fun for people like you who really enjoy this, and I enjoy it too. Uh, but for people who don't understand how any of this works, you talk about income assets. I mean, some things are taxed at ordinary income rates no matter what. Bonds throw off interest. That interest is taxable as ordinary income. Right. Same thing. So if I have a bond, $100,000 in bonds that are paying 4%, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice right now? Um, well, maybe you had it for a number of years. <laughs> yeah. So it's giving me $4,000 of interest and i'm paying it out to myself every year i'm over 59 and a half we'll say okay and that that four thousand dollar distribution will be taxed the exact same way as if i had that same investment in my ira and it was throwing off four thousand dollars in interest and being paid out to me on an annual basis or on basis so i'm getting four thousand out of my ira or I'm getting four that's coming from the interest of that bond, or I'm getting four thousand in interest from the bond directly because I owned it personally. It's the same tax treatment. So why not? Why not have it in the IRA if there's no advantage of making <laughs> get, doing it personally? So I mean, there and these are the kinds of issues. And if we've got also, if we're getting a little bit older than fifty nine and a half, we're getting up to seventy ish. If that four thousand dollars can help satisfy my required minimum distribution, that's all I need to take out for now. Why would I want to have that 4000 in my personal account and then have a growth asset in my IRA that I have to take 4000 out of anyway? So instead of having $4,000 of taxable income, I've got 8000 now of which I'm reinvesting it anyway. It just it, it gets complicated. <laughs> I understand. I'm trying to make it easy, but it's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm, try, I'm trying to ask the questions that the ordinary person would ask, which is why I come back and I say, huh? <laughs> okay, let's just, let's just nutshell this if we can in the few minutes that we have. Certain assets, certain things that you can own, like bonds, when you take it, when you take the distribution, when it, when it when it when creates paid, an income, like CDs, bonds, they like create that. ordinary income. It doesn't matter where those are; they're going to be you're going to pay ordinary income taxes either today them. or in the future. Sometimes somebody's going to pay ordinary income taxes on them. Well, if that's the case, you would prefer to see those assets where? Well, in the IRA, if the liquidity and the availability if i don't need that income until i get past 59 and a half yeah i'd rather see those income producing assets that are going to be tra- taxed the same way either way in my ira now what about something that uh, is a capital gains tax which would be let's just say stocks mutual funds yeah. the, the uh, typical stock mutual fund investments not the ones that you put in you know ten thousand and expect to be worth a million in three years yeah um I'm looking to have capital gain assets more in my personal account, if possible. doesn't always work that way because, as you mentioned earlier, people's only investment account is their 401k. So guess where they're going to buy every one of their investments? But if you have the option, in some cases, in many cases, uh, the capital gain assets should probably be looked at to be held in the personal account, if possible. Because, and definitely the Roth. Because you get a favorable tax treatment yes. by owning it that way. It's capital a lower, gains tax in 98% of the cases. Long-term capital gains. Long-term. Typically are in a lower tax bracket than they would be if that same amount of income was created from ordinary income. Well, since we brought this up, we only got another minute or two left here. Uh, people because they their work 401ks they have funds or whatever it is inside which uh-huh. you know capital assets wind up in their 401k is there anything wrong with owning stocks and mutual funds in your 401k i no. mean you're taking what could be a capital gains taxed asset but do you have a choice but when i and when i take it out it's going to be taxed at ordinary income do you have a choice uh, that's no. your only account, no. and you haven't been able to figure out how to save personally in the first place, other than emergency fund. You got to have an emergency fund. Yeah. No, okay. So in that case, it be the, the, there becomes the comes along one so other. It's, it's not a problem because saving inside your four hundred one k, even in stocks and everything like that, is still better than not saving. Here's why it may be better because let's say you're earning a good living and you're in a f- decently high. 22, 24, something like that, percent tax bracket, and you put your money in your 401k, that money is quote unquote deductible. In other words, oh, yeah. you're, you're not You're paying- deducting it today. It's saving you income taxes today right. by taking money out of your right pocket and putting it in your left pocket. Right. So even if I have to pay later on ordinary income taxes on that withdrawal from my 401k, 
there's a chance that those ordinary income taxes, I wrote it off in the 24% bracket, maybe I get to take it out in the 12. Yeah, maybe. And even if it's the 24, you get... It's a wash. It's a, it's a wash at that point. So right. it, it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean... It, but it can make a difference, especially the larger the size of the estate, the largest size of the portfolio, both split between personal and, and uh, tax deferred. The having the assets in the wrong accounts, the larger the accounts are, can make a bigger impact going forward. It really can, which is why you got a plan, which is why we're here, which is why you need. I would suggest to speak with an advisor about this because trying to understand this. I mean, I'm sitting here trying to make this simple for people listening, and. It's confusing. I mean, there are so many factors to consider in this puzzle. And, Professor, when you make one move here, it can create a much bigger effect down the road uh, if, 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 you, if you do it incorrectly. Well, it can create significant problems down the line uh, if you do not plan for it, shall we say. Yes. Uh, because like, if you have personal money and you have IRA money and you end up investing – the wrong way, I, I'll say it, you could then go from a reasonable tax bracket into a much higher tax bracket when the required minimum distributions step in. Yep. On the other side, if you're taking money out of the IRA, you're, you are paying a little bit more taxes today, but it may save you taxes in the future. doesn't always work that way, but you need to understand. So what we started off at the beginning saying we need to know where we are today so that we can make decisions about where we need to be in the future as to whether we go to the left or to the right to make ourselves better off over mm-hmm. time rather than just, you know, people that say always do the Roth, not always the best course, because especially for somebody who's starting late, who, you know, they're 55 and they're just now getting a chance to save, they're not going to build up millions of dollars in their tax deferred retirement account. They're going to get a couple hundred grand maybe. So the Roth wouldn't be so they're probably going to be They're probably going to be tax free in retirement anyway at that level. Whereas, you know, it could go the other way, too. So knowing where you are today and looking into the future, what's reasonable, what's feasible, what you, even on an opportunistic situation, if you're not going to be as high of an income in the future as you are today, the Roth doesn't make as much sense. Now, you see this stuff? This is the stuff that Professor Plum loves to do. I mean, I know, I'm kind of sick, aren't I? You really are. You need to get some hobbies. But in the meantime, <laughs> until you actually get some other hobbies... Everybody wants me to quit the hobbies I have. <laughs> well, all right. But in the meantime, until you get those, you can take advantage of Professor Plum. Uh, if you want to give him a call, learn more about your situation, location, asset allocation, how things could work for you, because your situation is vastly different from other people's. Everybody's got a unique situation. Give him a call. Anybody at Lucia Capital Group can help you out. I'll just give their number... Uh, Once again, 800-644-1150, 800-644-1150. You can talk to Professor Plum, as I said, or any of the Lucia Capital Group advisors. Important stuff, and if you didn't understand any of it, they can help you understand it because it will be pertinent to you. Trust me. All right, we're out of time. Uh, Once again, 800-644-1150. My thanks to Professor Rick Plum for joining me here. Also to Ray Lucia Jr. for suggesting the topic. If you have a topic you'd like us to deal with, you can certainly email us as well. Go to luciacap.com. For Professor Plum and Ray Lucia Jr., I'm Johnny Dean. This has been Managing Your Financial Future. The information provided should not be considered specific tax, legal, or investment advice. It is not intended or written and cannot be used for the purpose of avoiding penalties imposed by law. You should seek independent advice from a tax professional. This material was gathered from sources believed to be reliable. Its accuracy cannot be guaranteed. There can be no assurance that any specific investment or investment strategy will be either suitable or profitable for a client's or prospective client's portfolio. Thus, investment may result in a loss of principal. No client or prospective client should assume that the presentation or any component thereof serves as the receipt of or a substitute for personalized advice from LCG or from any other investment professional. Examples cited are hypothetical, are for illustrative purposes only, are not guaranteed, and subject to potential federal and state law amendments. There is no guarantee that you will achieve the results discussed or illustrated. Roth IRA distributions of principal from a Roth IRA are tax-free. Any earnings will be taxed at ordinary income rates, and a 10% penalty tax will apply if withdrawn prior to age 59 and a half or within five years of the date the Roth IRA was established whichever is longer. IRA withdrawals will be taxed at ordinary income rates. Withdrawals prior to age 59 and a half may also be subject to a 10% penalty tax. Investments in fixed income products are subject to but not limited to the following risks. Liquidity, interest rate, financial, inflation, and special tax liabilities. Interest may be subject to the alternative minimum tax. Treasury securities are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government but are subject to inflation risk. Lucia Capital Group is not affiliated with or endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any government agency. SSA website is at www.ssa.gov or call 800 7721213 to speak with an SSA representative. CDs are FDIC insured up to $250,000 per depositor per insured bank for each account ownership category. The investment performance
professionals are registered representatives with and securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and member FINRA SIPC. Lucia Securities LLC was acquired by LPL Financial August 2020. The investment professionals of Lucia Securities LLC are now affiliated with LPL Financial and are conducting business using the name Lucia Capital.